Hello, my fellow human beings. This is Robert Roach with the Type 1 Planet podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Alexandra McCall Garfinkel, and our guest, Juan Garcia Martinez, who is the research manager at the Alliance to Feed the Earth in Disasters, or AllFed. And you may remember AllFed from the previous episode that we did with Aaron Mill. I advise that you go check that out before you listen to this. This episode was a deeper dive into what AllFed actually does, the kind of research much of which is driven by Juan. So it was an amazing episode to get really to the granular details of what these resilient food solutions that AllFed is promoting look like. Now, uh, in global catastrophes, there are some things, there are situations in which there are low light scenarios. And these low light scenarios can have a major impact on global food production, which can in turn cause mass famine and huge issues for our population. So AllFed is completely oriented towards creating resilient food solutions that can survive in almost any environment and how we can implement those on a global basis. So some of these technologies are really astounding. They can be as simple as uh, growing seaweed on our coasts and as complicated as actually creating protein powder just using carbon dioxide and methane gas, these, these waste gases from factories, we can transfer those into bioreactors and start creating incredible proteins that people can actually eat. So it, we go into a lot of detail. Um, Juan is amazingly knowledgeable and we're probably going to do another follow-up episode, um, but I really hope you enjoy it. And please check out our social media, Type 1 Planet. Uh, please go to our website, type1planet.net, if you're interested in learning more about our project or want to contribute or reach out. Everything that we've received from our listeners has been absolutely fantastic, and especially suggestions we should talk to next. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening. Enjoy, and stay focused. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm Robert Roach. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Alexandra McCall Garfinkel, and our guest today Juan Garcia Martinez, he's the re, uh, research manager at the Alliance to Feed the Earth and Disasters, or AllFed. And Juan, you're calling in from beautiful Arenas in Andalusia, Spain, or as, as, as I pronounce it, <laughs> in southern Spain. So that's okay, right. Great. And uh, so you'll, for everyone listening, you're going to hear some beautiful sounds of birds and children playing and that kind of stuff in the background. So I, I think that's a great backdrop for this, this uh, conversation today. Juan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, this episode will actually be released about a month or so after our last interview with Aaron Mill, who is the project lead and research associate for AllFed. And so we're going to do a little bit of a quick recap um, on what AllFed is. It seeks to, it says on the website, it seeks to identify various resilient food solutions to help governments and companies implement these solutions to feed everyone in the event of a global catastrophe. So tell us, Juan, what are these, you know, the, what do these catastrophes look like? You know, there's a, a graphic that we've seen that has a spectrum of declines in food production, 1%, 10%, all the way up to 100. What has, have we ever experienced anything like this? It, you know, what does a uh, food reduction look like and, and why do they happen? Uh, again, to add to that recap, our mission could be established as increasing resilience to global food production shocks, what we call waffle production shocks, and our motto is feeding everyone no matter what, including the most extreme scenarios like the ones you described. Um, now, there's historically been, um, and I know you discussed with Aaron, food production shocks on the scale of what we're talking about, like 10% of the entire global food production. Um, most famously, there was the year without summer uh, about 200 years ago, uh, which was caused by a super volcanic eruption, which caused an abrupt sunlight reduction scenario which is what we're going to be talking about later, um, uh, making uh, crop, crops fail uh, to a significant degree in Europe, um, some other regions, um, island regions were less affected. Um, and the ones that we're most concerned about are the ones that could be the most catastrophic, um, as those are the ones that have the most capacity to affect the long-term future of humanity. Uh, so when we're talking about, for example, uh, the most extreme shocks, um, not just 10%, which is unprecedented in recent history, uh, certainly in our interconnected society. When we go all the way up to the most extreme scenarios that people have proposed in the literature, up to 90% of total global food production loss, um, then you start getting into the uh, into the type of things that could cause a societal collapse. Um, and even before that, some would argue, 
but the, the case gets stronger, the stronger the, the drop is. And for those, we are we have only the most extreme scenarios, um, including um, within this category of abrupt satellite reaction scenarios, we have uh, a very large asteroid uh, or comet impact, uh, which is the least likely in our opinion, then a very large climate changing volcanic eruption of unprecedented proportions that could also happen. And finally, the most serious threat, which is uh, a nuclear winter originating from a nuclear war uh, burning significant number of cities. And those are the most extreme. Those are the closest to the end of light, up to 90% a loss of global food production. Okay, got it. So you have these abrupt light reduction scenarios. Let's just take volcanoes, for example. We're In the United States, we're sitting on top of Yellowstone. So um, we've got a great, great candidate uh, right around on right our doorstep. Um, so your your teams, they're looking at a potential scenario like the one with a, a volcanic eruption and, and saying, okay, what, what action would we take in order to be resilient now? What action would we take now in order to be resilient in that scenario to still produce food? And then what will we do after it happens? Are those, do you kind of create two different strategies in those, in those cases? So things that we can do right now versus things that we would do in the case of the event? We are working on both. We're working on both ends. Um, so all of these scenarios have uh, the common thread that they're all caused by the same mechanism. You know, the lodging of like aerosol material on the atmosphere, causing a lot less sunlight to reach the earth. And it's kind of a loss of function situation. And we're looking at how to uh, respond to that loss of function, loss of uh, sunlight to agricultural function. And the solutions would be very similar in all of those cases. Um, we're working, uh, like you said, on first, uh, preparedness, resilience. Uh, we're communicating with governments and policymakers um, to uh, make them understand the importance of putting in place low cost, um, you know, highly cost effective resilience measures in place um, to be more prepared uh, with a very tiny amount of their budget in case something like this ever happens. That's part of our strategy, the preparedness part. The other part is uh, related, but slightly different. We also um, are working on response planning for governments, which is more on the end of like, okay, it has happened. What are the things that you need to do immediately? What are your best options? Instead of just throwing your hands in the air and being like, oh, what do we do? Uh, have a list of things that you can do, like you do for many other catastrophes. You know, people do this for uh, sea quakes, tsunamis. Um, even there's there's an international plans for that, which is rare. Uh, you know, big fires. Um, uh, many many recurring catastrophes are being planned for. So there is precedent for for things like this. And what and yeah. what are those um, kind of what do those action proposals for the governments look like? I mean, do you have examples of kind of con consistent uh, actions that you recommend across governments? Or is it region specific? Is it a global response or really country by country, um, you know, individual response? Okay. Yeah. Both. Both. Um, we have uh, recommendations for governments that could be applied to anywhere in the world. And then we are also working on region specific recommendations because this being a catastrophe that would affect different regions in very different ways that need to be specific recommendations. Um, in order to be able to go into those concrete recommendations, I guess I would first need to define a bit what has happened so that the recommendations make sense to the readers, sorry, to the listeners. Um, so I guess I will very briefly talk about uh, that how these scenarios work. So they are um, scenarios that cause significant decrease uh, in temperature, precipitation, and uh, sunlight that the plants need to do photosynthesis. Um, based on the latest modeling, um, there people have come up with uh, modeling of like different severities of the scenario. We normally focus on the strongest severities for the reasons I've said before. The they are the most likely to have a long term impact. Um, to give you a flavor of the worst case scenario, for example, uh, the second year after catastrophe has stricken. Um, we're talking a severe nuclear winter scenario here. Um, the global averages would look like a drop in temperature from 10 to 16 degrees. Um, and for comparison, the last age, the last ice age 20,000 years ago was something like five degrees cooler. So this is like two to three times worse uh, at the peak of the scenario. 
Uh, this includes freezing temperatures on most of the northern hemisphere, so the ground's frozen in a lot of it. Uh, I can't grow crops. Um, solar radiation and rain precipitation are more than half. And all of these causes uh, a collapse of crop growth, um, 80 to 90% of current values. This is a taste of like the worst case scenario that has been modeled. Um, so how do you respond to this, right? Um, but currently we have, um, we're producing according to our models about 5,600 kilocalories per capita, uh, compared to 2,100 roughly that the average person needs to survive. Uh, so we're producing more than twice as we need to feed everyone on earth, uh, right now. And half of that is going to biofuels, animal feed, uh, you know, animals or net calorie sinks. Uh, you need like maybe to put on, on some of them 20 calories in to get one calorie out. So that's using a lot of our, our food right now. Um, if something like this ever happens, we will do like 80, 90% of that. We will have like less than half of what we need to feed people, uh, widespread starvation. So if we assume that in this scenario, in this worst case scenario, international trade completely breaks down, no food system adaptations are made, only about 20 food percent, sorry, only about 20% of people could survive from the food production available. And then what could we do about that? Well, if we did significant adaptations, including stopping animal agriculture, reduce, mostly um, reducing biofuel production, uh, doing optimal food stock allocation, rationing, reducing food waste, we could push that number up to 60% maybe. And that's with optimal allocation. Uh, if on top of that, you deploy these solutions that we're talking about, these resilient food solutions, and you maintain international trade, because then you're, some countries are like producing more than they need if they deploy this, then that number will go up to 150%, which means that technically no one would need to starve. Uh, it is hard to pull off, but it is demonstrated to be technically feasible, according to our research. Um, so, well, that would still be producing... Even in that best case scenario, even in that, you know, effective response scenario, we would still be producing less than half as much food as we're producing now, prices will go through the roof. Uh, poor uh, economically disadvantaged regions would require food aid still or um, subsidies, etc. But overall, in most countries, according to our research, these food system adaptations and resilient food solutions could make the difference between not having enough to feed the local population and having enough surplus to export. You know, to avoid a refugee crisis, avoid a humanitarian disaster of unprecedented proportions. I think a, I think a really important key feature of what you're talking about here is that the current way we make food wouldn't work in this in the the scenarios you're talking about. Right? We couldn't have vast amounts of calorie inefficient livestock, and we couldn't, you know, continue to create and ship food around in the way that we do now. So, are these food solutions? These food solutions that you're talking about, they're specifically designed to ex to be viable in in these kinds of scenarios. Um, and and can you start to tell us a little bit about what those solutions actually look like? Yes, that's what I was going oh, next. So that's exactly right. The number of countries in which the current food system as it is right now would still work in these scenarios can be counted with uh, two, maybe one hand. Uh, basically, everyone would need to make very extremely large adjustments if they want to survive, uh, or most of the population to survive. And what we're talking about here is um, a quick recap, uh, what we call cool tolerant crop relocation, um, seaweed cultivation, um, industrial uh, agriculture independent food production, that's my topic of research, and um, decentralized food solutions, uh, these are some only some of them. We have a much longer list, but these are we think the most interesting ones for different reasons. Uh, so I will, I it probably makes sense to focus on them. Great. Right. So I'm going to talk about first what they are, roughly um, why we think they're interesting, like their benefits, some challenges with them, and basically the actions that we have proposed governments to do to create resilience and to respond post catastrophe. So I guess I can start with crop relocation. Um, what we're talking about is switching to different crops that are better adapted for growing in these new harsher conditions for these scenarios. And this could be, uh, this would include basically uh, the increased planting of new crops, uh, like for example, uh, places that are now 
tropical, don't have warm climates, are not growing canola oil, but that is being grown in like Northern Europe. So maybe those countries could grow canola oil after the catastrophe, um, rapeseed, you know, after, um, because the climate has changed significantly. Um, and the same goes for maybe barley, wheat, potatoes, turnips, beets, and some others. And then we're also talking about the increased planting of cold tolerant crop varieties. For example, uh, cold tolerant wheat varieties, cold tolerant barley varieties, and so on. In places that are already growing like wheat or barley and things like that. Um, do these cold do these cold tolerant the var variations exist already? Yes, yes. You wouldn't need to create them after the catastrophe. Um, we're talking about things that are already being grown around the world. It's just basically moving them around. This is the idea of moving... Um, either within the boundaries of a country or internationally, seeds of these cool tolerant plants so that they can be grown in the new climate. And one uh, another just like specific question about those crops, um, it, you know, before we continue. So, you know, we're, you said we're talking about 10 to 16 degrees um, difference. Just to confirm, do you mean Celsius or, or Fahrenheit when you say that? Oh, sorry. Yes. Celsius. Celsius. Okay. So that's, I mean, extreme of course, as you mentioned, extreme temperature shift. So the crops that we have now that are cold resistant, what range of cold resistance do they have um, currently? And is that an avenue that's being explored to extend kind of the severity of response they're able to, to be resilient with them? Great question. I am not an expert on that. Um, I know that the models suggest, uh, like we are modeling growing these in the areas where the climate variation, you know, this is a global average. There are some regions that will not be as affected. So in many regions, the growing conditions will still be well within the um, the, the temperature ranges that these crops can grow. And that's what we're uh, talking about. But I unfortunately cannot give you... No, that's about. totally okay. I, I'm just thinking, you know, as, you know, as we kind of imagine this range of effect, right, where there might be a, rather than a linear effect on productivity, um, you know, from the circum, you know, the equator up to the pole, out to the poles, more of a like logarithmic effect where it's more extreme in the as you go from the center of the equator. Is that a, in, is that accurate, or is it more like a linear effect that you know is going to be relatively the same, just um, starting from different kind of median temperatures that exist now? Um, rather than thinking about functions, uh, I'm going to tell you, it would certainly be worse impacts in the Northern Hemisphere for various reasons. It has also, that has also been the case historically with uh, volcanic eruptions where this has happened. Um, Southern Hemisphere will be in a much better position, um, uh, specifically um, around the tropic borders and south of them. So we're talking, for example, uh, countries that would be least affected include um, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina. Um, so interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, it does. And I mean, um, it's just interesting to think, right? Like kind of the Northern hemisphere and the Northern, Northern, the Northern part of the Northern hemisphere really losing, you know, I know that a lot of, um, Northern Europe does a huge amount of crop production, right? Wheat, barley, as you say, and thinking about realistically how much could be maintained there with cold resistant crops or whether everything is shifting south in such a way where then we have this almost like dead zone where we're not going to be able to grow anything like in this kind of crop relocation is there a region that then kind of becomes non-viable and outside of that you're moving crops around or is it do you see it as we're able to maintain kind of a higher percentage of the land you know that we grow on now if we're doing this crop relocation right um i would say areas that are very much towards the north right now uh, on the north um like northern europe canada russia it would be very hard to grow anything at all and the type of storage we're talking about uh in fact our model predicts that in those regions uh the most Highly impactful interventions are probably industrial food production because those regions do have uh, industrial capital and resources to deploy these solutions, but would be very difficult to grow anything. Like a lot of the ground will be frozen. Um, 
other more intermediate regions, maybe the US, uh, Southern Europe, and so on, would be able to still uh, move crops around, even within their own borders, um, and um, move to uh, the new, to new crops that can still be grown. Uh, but basically, uh, crop growth is mostly um, what's is mostly working much better in, in the southern hemisphere, uh, tropical regions, and so on. Um, so you could see this as, for example, something that people have proposed is like, well, moving seeds from those regions that actually have the cold tolerant crops being cultivated right now towards the southern regions, uh, expecting, you know, um, the fully formed foods in return. That's my okay. idea. Yeah, yeah, and this is where really international uh, cooperation becomes a critical piece of this type of model, as you've been talking about. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Just kind of wanted to get a global picture of of the scenario. Has Allfed ever spoken with Crop Trust in respect to this? Um, Crop Trust is the organization that is responsible for the seed banks, like the Svalbard Seed Bank. Um, we had an interview with Dr. Sarada Krishnan, who's um, she heads up programming and and everything for Crop Trust. And th what they're working on is not only are they uh, creating these awesome seed banks, but they are creating um, another form of genetic of gene banking is to cultivate different kinds of crops that uh, cannot be held as seeds. For example, like a sweet potato. Um, they basically have fields that are located in different parts around the earth that are uh, specifically designed to just keep that version, that genetic lineage going in a closed, in a, an enclosed environment. And so I'm wondering if it's, you know, if there's a way instead of relocating in the event of disaster of tapping into banks that are already existing in different locations, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know if something yeah. like that's possible. I see. Yeah. I am aware of that. Uh, I think Dave Denkenberger, office director of research, has probably talked to them. Uh, I would say one thing, though. My impression is that they're mostly doing it for conservation reasons. Um, what we need in these type of scenarios, um, and I'm talking outside of my expertise, but my understanding is um, what we need is like a stockpile of seeds. Like We need a lot of them. We need to take the seeds that are being grown, say, like in the entire of Scandinavia, for like rapeseed and move those because uh, they already have a developed industry. You know, they have a lot of production. They, have, they would have a lot of seeds. Uh, if you have, have only a very small amount, say from a seed bag, you would need to grow those, then make seeds from those, then grow them again, then make seeds again. That's, you know, that slows down response significantly. You need to have kind of a fully formed um, industry uh, go working already in order to respond to the degree of speed and scale that is required for these scenarios. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the scale. I mean, I think that's a really important thing to always consider when you're, I mean, thinking across um, resources and techniques, right? I mean, it is a challenge constantly because there's potentially a good idea or model that comes from crop trust in terms of having these banks. But is there a way to do it at the scale that's actually effective for rapid response? to um food production loss yeah and that but yeah and that is uh, that's a definitely a different scale <laughs> okay well, we might come back to that topic then yeah. um and maybe uh, we can get crop trust in on the conversation too and and talk about some cool solutions um let's let's dive into some of your other technologies that you're working with including uh one that we're very interested in single cell proteins that you're creating from natural gases t t tell us about that yeah, of course. So uh, this is, I'm not creating them. Uh, there are companies that are creating them. I'm mostly studying mm, the potential. Okay, okay great. Tell us about that. Yeah. So the description of the process roughly is, uh, the heart of the process is the bioreactor where the microorganisms are being grown. Um, what you put in there is everything that these microorganisms need to thrive and uh, multiply rapidly. And that includes things like a carbon source. For in the case of natural gas, that would be methane, which contains carbon. An energy source, which is again methane in this case, uh, which is energy rich, as you know, when you burn natural gas, you get a lot of energy. Um, and then a oxygen source, you can get that from the air, air distillation or separation. And finally, a nitrogen source, that could be urea or ammonia, the same stuff that we make fertilizers from. 
you put all that into the bioreactor and at the optimal conditions, you are producing a lot of microorganisms, like a huge amount. You get that out, some of that out, it's a continuous process normally, or batch you can do that. You dry that, process that, and you get a protein powder, if that's what you want, or you can post-process that into uh, foods. You can use it as an ingredient to fortify foods. It's very high quality protein, highly digestible, uh, very, very good amino acid profile. Um, so the idea with that is we would want to, for the regions that have the capacity to do so, deploy uh, tens, hundreds of these factories at industrial scale, 100,000 tons per year um, production levels uh, to produce um, food for, say, feeding their animals, at least that's what they want, or feeding people, uh, because it has already been done. Uh, that would be the most efficient use of it. Um, so that would really help with the downfall of uh, crop production, because it's en entirely uncorrelated with food production. You're getting food from something that's entirely inedible, and that has not been affected by the catastrophe necessarily directly. Uh, like a climate change volcano eruption, uh, eruption need not uh, affect the Deploy their capacity to deploy factories if you haven't been like, um, if you're not the country that has been affected by the volcano directly, right? Um, so just to give you an idea, yeah. How good is this protein powder? I mean, it's 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 kind of interesting to me. I mean, I really see it as as a uh, a potential product that you could make money on now. You know, it's such a unique and concept that could be funding some of these organizations. Is anyone doing something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, just this year, the largest, the first, one of the largest fermentation facilities, first large-scale industrial food production of this type is starting operation uh, at 10,000 tons per year. That's a lot. Um, they're, I imagine, going to make a lot of money of it. Uh, you know, they're still on the st um, stage of reducing costs. Uh, they're doing it to actually... Um, for fish feed, you know, they're trying to cover a very specific need for extremely high quality fish feed that is now in the industry uh, to like uh, substitute uh, basically fishing small fish to turn into powder and feed them to the big fish instead of feed the bacteria or the fungi or whatever to the microorganisms, in this case bacteria, to the um, fish. And that's uh, because the fish are very big and they need extremely high quality ingredients. That's why they're feeding them this. But they are also, this same company uh, and also a competitor are already working on um, using this as a food ingredient for human food. And they will be probably releasing products in the coming decade. Most very extremely likely. What are the names of these companies? Can do you remember? Uh, yes. Uh, two that come to mind are Calista. Those are the ones that, are, that will start producing very large quantities this year, and also Unibio. I might email you about that just to make sure I get the names right, but maybe we could talk to them too. That's that's an interesting okay. idea. Because I, I think a big part of this is figuring out how we can turn these technologies that are extremely helpful into things that could thrive in a capitalistic environment, which is what's happening around the world. You know, it needs to ex coexist with capitalism, and if it's possible to, yes. to scale using capitalism, then great. Um, so tell us a little. So these are these are basically bioreactors that are, okay. Yes, I can tell you about their potential in a catastrophe. I mean, according to my to my calculations, you could fulfill the protein requirements for the entire global population in two point five to four point five years if you're really serious about it, just by deploying this methane single cell protein production uh, technologies, um, and you can get. Uh, it would still be like at an affordable retail cost. Three to five dollars per kilogram drive, affordable to a large majority of the world global population. Um, interestingly, most of the of the production required to fulfill the global population's protein requirements could come from what they call stranded natural gas. That's natural gas sources that right now are not economical to um, to exploit. Uh, you know, they're either too small or too far or too hard to access. Uh, but that would not be nearly as much of an issue for, for these technologies. Um, so if you were to leverage all of those stranded natural gas sources and use it to produce protein, you could almost produce enough protein for everyone in the world right now, 8 billion people. And is that using, um, you know, we? I think in the last interview we talked a little bit about repurposing uh, infrastructure that already exists. Uh, is that part of this scenario um, in terms of actual... Great yeah. question. 
Yeah, so that's future research. Um, I would like to do a project on studying, uh, and I have some ideas for partners, on studying how could we repurpose existing infrastructures to do this. Um, the ones that we've studied in terms of repurposing infrastructure are um, cellulosic sugar factories. Uh, that is producing sugar from inedible plant matter, like plant fiber. Um, and for that, we've already done the research. We've established that there's significant potential, for example, for converting paper factories, for converting um, first generation biofuel production facilities like sugarcane facilities, uh, and obviously second generation um, biofuel production facilities, although there are few, say, few to none in the world at the moment. Ideally, that should change in the future. Um, but but those are the ones where we know that repurposing uh, seems to have very high potential. And in fact, one of our recommendations that we could make into governance is like, please pilot these technologies. Please go and change, like invest on changing an existing facility of each kind to prove that it can be done so that this can be deployed mm. in time if a catastrophe ever happens. Sorry, yeah. So in that vein, I mean, I, thinking through exactly like you're talking about the the realistic deployment of of this technology and how as we discussed earlier how we would need rapid response capacity in both you know, like quantity but then also kind of sustained um food production in the event of a global disaster um how long like from right now if you were able to talk to policymakers you know right now and give them your best argument to invest in this type of pilot study and then um, kind of planning, how long do you think it would actually set up if they started now to have, you know, the capacity required to, in an event, really, you know, in that 2.5 to four years, have enough, you know, food for global, um, uh, food for global requirements um, that in that case. Okay, just to clarify, the question is how long would it take yeah. deploying these technologies to reach like, a significant If you were able to kind of get people to start investing right now in this type of you know pilot study and then building the technology, building the reactors, how long do you think right. it would actually take to get to you know the infrastructure required to respond to the natural disaster? Right. Okay. So so first, like clarifying um, first clarification, um, what we're talking about here is we would like. Uh, government, company, someone to go and prove that this can be done at pilot scale, at industrial scale, uh, so that the technology is ready to be deployed. Now that we have the different question, we're not advocating for deploying all of those facilities now. Uh, no, at all. That's actually not cost effective. Um, we're advocating for be ready to deploy hundreds of these if it ever happens. And so then we have the question of like, how long right. did that take, right? Um, to give you a flavor, um, like I said, for methane, for example, methane single cell protein, based on uh, their capital resource intensity and so on, uh, my models say that between 2.5 to 4.5 years, you could have enough protein to fulfill the protein requirements, not the calorie requirements, of the population. Uh, for cellulosic sugar, um, actually I have it just uh, right here, let me check the value. Um, we estimate that uh, the by deploying this, you know, by repurposing existing infrastructures, the, maybe deploying new factories, you could fulfill the entire current global sugar demand in maybe a hour after the catastrophe um, happens. Uh, if you're really serious about it, you know, if you really invest like, oh, 24-7 construction, uh, deployment of uh, hundreds of facilities, um, it can be done. Um, it's It will be a bit like, you know, a wartime effort, like World War II, reconvert all industry, uh, but, but the models uh, that we have right now show a lot of potential. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great clarification. And um, I want to let Robert ask another question, but I would love to hear um, more about the kind of policymaker actions um, for resilience, response, et cetera. But uh, before we go into that, Robert, I interrupted you. No, that's exactly where I was going to go, actually, Ali. You, I've, education is going to be a big part of this, educating governments on what's possible. First of all, what might happen and then what's possible in those scenarios. Um, how do you approach talking to some of the most dysfunctional organizations in the world, which are governments? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, it's not easy. There are many ways that you can go about this. Um, you can go the science policy interface route, you know, create networks with co policy makers, uh, educate them on the science. I actually have a separate organization, 12 with working on this, uh, that I'm co-directing. Um, then the, you know, kind of like informal diplomacy, um, you could create reports for government and network them. Uh, through relevant stakeholders in government. That's what we're doing at Allfed, um, you know, writing this resilience plans, strategy plans, response plans, uh, putting them in front of decision makers, um, try to get their attention. Um, there's the legislative route. Um, you could uh, propose changes to existing legislation or legislation that's being revised to include some of these ideas. Um, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of food legislation um, you could uh, try to change, um, put these recommendations that I've been talking about and that I, do, that I will develop more later into legislative language so that they're written down into law and then the government agencies and institutions have to do something about it. Uh, it's a different question as to whether they will do what is needed, but that is one step further in, from doing nothing, right? Um, those are mostly the things that come to mind in terms of how to... Um, get this to mm. to a point where it creates real resilience from the perspective great fantastic it's 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 a really difficult question uh and and many of the the organizations that we talk to you know basically it's like do we make it profitable on a capitalistic scale or do we try to convince governments that this is the right idea and uh in some ways it's like making it profitable on a capitalistic scale is the easier you know, path. So it's, um, it's, it's yeah. going to be interesting to think, see how things pan out. Um, what, yeah, but that's some of the most pot high potential technologies just are not, um, some are, some aren't, so it's hard. And like you say, it is hard to convince governments. Like, um, if nearly 200 hearings on pandemic preparedness did not prepare us for COVID that shows, do not prepare the U S specifically I'm talking about, even though I'm not a U S person. Um, that shows just how hard it is to get the message across and to actually create real preparedness. Even with all those hearings, uh, the government was still not as agile as it could have been in deploying new technologies, which is, you know, a relevant precedent for the type of style we're talking mm -hmm. about. Absolutely. That requires the same intervention. Yeah. If you could ask them, you know, if in these proposals that you're writing, that you're trying to basically get in front of people who can make these decisions at a legislative level, um, what are you know two or three really key things that you are trying to get them to start doing now? Right. The number one is response planning. Um, go create your own response plans. Go and do your own research. Go pay experts. Go gather your your uh, government academic experts. Put together a response plan like you've done for okay. catastrophes. We know you can do it. Just do it yeah. for this. They've done it for a nuclear blast. Do it for a nuclear winter. Right. Um, Another one could be targeted investments. Targeted investments are fundamental. This is what I'm talking about. Like, uh, go fund someone to do a pilot of this, a pilot of 24-7 factory construction, a pilot of repurposing a paper factory or a biorefinery. Um, go create um, public-private uh, partnerships with, the, with, with companies who have this. Um, Technology with this knowledge, these technologies, they know how to deploy them so that you are ready to deploy your entire capacity and use the know how. Um, I, I could keep going, but th those are probably important ones. Let's, let's bring it back a little bit to single cell proteins because there's one other element of your research that was interesting and kind of related to what we've done here. Uh, we recently released an interview that covers space agriculture and the development of crop systems in low Earth orbit. Um, and it was mm -hmm. really interesting to learn that, you know, and, and that was a really amazing conversation because all of the alarm bells go off in your mind of like, how is this in remotely economical or possible? But there's a lot of teams that are think that it is. And, um, it was interesting to learn then in your research that, uh, you've done some, some talking about food production in space from the perspective of creating microbial proteins or using CO2. So what are the findings of this research? Like, what is an efficient way to create life-sustaining food in space? 
That's right. So the reason we did this research is because of the alignment with the response uh, to the catastrophe, right? Uh, converting um, inedible feedstocks and, you know, um, like CO2 in this case, uh, to things that people can eat will be useful not only in space, but also in a catastrophe. And that's, uh, there's the microbial protein, like you've said. Uh, we've also studied in a lot of depth um, non-biological synthesis for converting CO2 to carbohydrates and the um, utilization of microorganisms as microbial factories um, to through electrosynthesis, through microbial electrosynthesis, produce different products. Um, and we did this because our research showed that these are energy efficient ways to produce food. Um, somewhere ranging between 10, 20% electricity to calories conversion. Uh, that is one like unit of power that you put in uh, produces uh, say 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 uh, units of energy in terms of uh, edible calories. Um, so for example, the on, there's there's two of these that are a lot more developed um, and very recently actually the, the microbial um, pro uh, protein, the single cell protein from CO2 um, and hydrogen, uh, CO2 is the carbon source, hydrogen is the energy source in this case, is already being uh, piloted uh, for its use in, in space by some companies, uh, Solar Foods comes to mind. Uh, I think they got a contract with the ESA. Someone also has a contract for, with NASA to do this, uh, to do experiments. Um, and the reason why NASA is interested in this is because they want to increase the distance they can go with their with their um, uh, spacecrafts in manned missions and because it is very expensive to launch a lot of food that's required for these long-term missions in space. And so what you can do is you can create, try to create a system that's ideally as circular as possible, you know, uh, CO2 goes in the machine, food comes out, people eat the food, CO2 comes out of the people, CO2 goes into the machine and so on. Uh, it's uh, very difficult, possibly impossible to completely close the loop, but the more closed it is, the less amount of mass that you need to put into the um, uh, spaceship at first, and the further it will allow you to go, the less expensive it will be. Um, so that's the the single cell protein has a lot of potential for that because it has a lot of very interesting nutritional qualities in terms of not only the high quality uh, protein but also uh, in relevant fats, a lot of relevant micronutrients. So that's why it's very important for this. There's also the non-biological synthesis of converting CO2 through electrochemistry uh, into sugars uh, that has been done by your company and it's uh, in, you know they need for a NASA contest uh, it was funny because I was writing um, this paper on it I was like it would be nice if someone did this like I proposed a mechanism to produce glycerol which is also a carbohydrate but I was like if someone could produce a targeted synthesis of sugar that'd be great and then like one month before I published the paper they did it so I interviewed it for that and I, had I actually uh, went to a pitch an environmental pitch competition here in Connecticut and air company, the, the I think his name is Shepard, was one of the um, the mm. founders, and he was presenting for this this remarkable organization, and and they also make commercial products like uh like they created vodka out of out of air, <laughs> you know they like break down, yes. and so they're they're doing some really amazing stuff. We're we're gonna have them on for sure. Um, it's just a matter of when, but that that's great that you just mentioned them. Love to hear that one. Yeah. And to try the airbase. Yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> I want some. It's sold out. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me. Uh, I know. Maybe we can get an in. With an interview. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am so, so fascinated with this, th like the details of the single cell um, protein production. Because obviously, like in the lab, you know, I use bacteria all the time, right? But mostly to efficiently replicate DNA. So make a lot of DNA, you know, for listeners who don't know what a PCR is, basically you give bacteria a little piece of DNA and then you cycle their temperatures in a specific way that allows them to very rapidly produce a beautifully large amount of that. Um, and so that's something that's been you know done for decades. Um, but I think it's really, really ingenious to think about 
those systems in rapidly producing, you know, biofuel molecules, right? Um, and so where, how did that come about? I mean, that just seems so logical, but the fact that it's a relatively new technology it is therefore kind of surprising, but but it is. So how did that theoretically kind of come about? Do you, do you know and like where where it really is now? I do. It's funny that you'd say it's a very new technology. Most people just don't know that this is actually old news. Um, they started around the 60s, 70s, actually. Some would say that's old. Um, they, for example, the hydrogen and CO2 single cell protein, that came, the idea came from uh, some early NASA tests that they run. Uh, I've read the original reports, it's fascinating, uh, in the 60s, specifically for this, because they were interested in this idea of like the closed loop for production systems and using it for food in space. Then separately, I think in the 70s, uh, people did a different type of single cell protein. They used uh, petroleum byproducts to grow uh, a lot of like industrial scale, tens of thousands of tons of protein uh, based on petroleum byproducts to use as animal feed. And they went and did that. Like this, this has been in operation. Um, it, I don't think it's done now, but uh, many companies were in operation. Uh, it's a similar idea, uh, except it was like liquid fermentation instead of um, gas fermentation, like the ones we've been talking about so far. But still, like, um, it's not such a new technology if you think about it. Oh, yeah. older. I mean, that's older than, right, PCR genetics. I mean, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, very cool. So then is the main distinction between kind of those early technologies, what we're talking about now, is really the ability to do the gas. Do it with gas rather than liquid, or like in uh, environments that are more, you know, would be more difficult to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, like liquid fermentation, we've been doing it for ages. Beer, right? Um, people were more familiar with that. Um, so that's what they used to produce, this biomass protein. Um, lately, um, but, but, you know, they also in the 60s knew how to do gas fermentation, like those NASA tests that I was talking about, but they hadn't done it at scale. Now it has been done at scale. Now we have this, you know, I'm just talking about this uh, industrial food production factory, 10,000 tons per year that the that Calista has done in China. Um, we can now do that at scale. We know now. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Wow. I can't wait to talk to a Calista. That sounds awesome. Um <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, I, I hate to move on, but um, we're probably going to come back to this. We'll have you on uh, maybe just to talk about single cell protein production um, at some point. Um, <laughs> oh, got a lot to you. talk about. Got to talk about yeah. <laughs> um, the, another, another cool technology that Aaron brought up in, in our interview um, that we're interested in learning more about is seaweed cultivation. You know, it's, it's been kind of being thrown around in the culture right now as a a cool technology and uh there's been i've seen books around it um you know it's a low tech high yield resilient food solution well what is is what's being where we're being told what is up with seaweed and why is it so uh potentially important right so quantitatively you can think of seaweed as something that goes very fast in even in adverse conditions and can be produced at a low cost in many situations so Think of growth rates of 3 to 20% dry mass per day. That's huge. When you, you know, you do that day after day after day, we're talking exponential growth for like some time, right? That's huge. Um, and even like our models predict that in some regions, this could take place even in nuclear winter. And in fact, in the most extreme nuclear winter scenarios for various reasons, um, some, some places could grow even more uh, see with or even more efficiently than they can now, uh, which was interesting. It doesn't require fresh water to grow. Uh, it doesn't share the same vulnerabilities as land crops, you know, pests, weeds, etc. Um, so requires little solar radiation. You know, it goes under the ocean. It doesn't get all that much. So if you cultivate it in the surface, um, those are like the you know rough reasons why this is so interesting and why our latest modeling shows that they are incredibly high potential. What is the nutritional value of seaweed for human beings? That de depends very strongly on the species of seaweed that we're talking about. Um, seaweed um, being easy to cultivate has the um, disadvantage that is not as interesting from the nutrition perspective as a lot of the other stuff that we're talking about. Um, there's huge variation depending on the species, but now that you can produce fats, you can produce protein, carbohydrates from, from seaweed, 
right? You can select for specific species that produce one or the other. Those may or may not be the best ones to grow in a nuclear winter uh, or in sunlight reduction scenario of other kind. But, uh, you know, uh, there's a huge potential. And in fact, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has been pushing for, for seaweed deployment in food insecure countries, say in Africa and other regions, uh, for a while now. Um, now, in terms of nutrition, um, some concerns, uh, personally, um, and that I've shared with the team, uh, include that, for example, um, there are, um, it is difficult to digest it, like it has low digestibility. Um, and interestingly, this varies a lot, depending on what you're from, like what your gut flora is. Um, for example, people in Japan have very good gut flora for digesting seaweed. But people in the Western world uh, don't have uh, nearly as much uh, capacity to digest it, which is interesting. But you can, you know, you can create it in yourself if you eat a lot of it, uh, potentially. But uh, it's not just there by default. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one issue. I wow, see. that's so interesting. <laughs> and generally, the protein, <laughs> yeah, and the protein quality of seaweed generally is quite a bit lower than, for example, uh, animal protein, soy protein. Uh, single cell protein, which are of the similar quality, you know, like top quality proteins. It's even lower than a lot of other uh, plants that are not beans that also have, uh, you know. Um, so those are like some nutritional nutritional disadvantages of it, but it's it makes up for it by being able to grow a scale very fast and to significant degrees. Yeah. So that could potentially be kind of a bridging in a disaster scenario, like a nuclear winter. That's something where there's very little infrastructure required to actually scale that quickly. And that's something we could actually do ahead of time because, you know, it is still a commercial product already. Um, is, is that kind of how you see it potentially being used uh, most effectively in a nuclear winter scenario? Yeah, you could, uh, you know, uh, move, create hatcheries, move the spores around, around the world, start producing. Uh, even if there's been like uh, infrastructure destruction, uh, because it's low tech, it's easier to deploy than say, I don't know, factories like we've been talking right. about, right? Um, so yeah. And, and by low tech, I mean it's basically ropes and buoys. Yeah, ropes, buoys, poles, boats. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Not much else. You can do it as high tech as you want, right? Just like any other type of aquaculture, agri agriculture, etc. But you can do, get a lot out of it by using just simple, simple systems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be diving into seaweed. I think a lot on this show. Uh, funnily enough, because it's there seems to be a lot of applications, um, and it has uh, the capability of potentially uh, helping the the aquatic environment as well, and and rebuilding ecosystems in the water. And you know, and and, and there's carbon. It, it there's uh, it also recaptures carbon. Is that right? Carbon capture. Yeah. Sequestration. Great. So let's plenty of benefit for seaweed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's kind of, uh, let's pull in all these technologies that we've been talking about and talk about, you know, obviously there's these low light uh, scenarios, which are very, you know, catastrophically difficult to navigate and, you know, difficult to get, you know, all these governments on the same page. Could these technologies be implemented to benefit a society that isn't experiencing a catastrophic event, you know? Let's let's put in a best case scenario here. We don't go through a catastrophic event, but as a civilization, we're able to maybe start to utilize these technologies and make our world better. For example, like one thing I'm thinking of is using single cell proteins to feed our livestock instead of using other livestock to you know using lower and lower costs to create uh, proteins to feed our livestock. You know what are what are some other scenarios in your mind that you think, oh man, this could really benefit society if we were able to get it going on a big scale? Yes, thank you for this question. It's one I've been thinking a lot about over the years. So the question is not all of the resilient foods, but there is still a lot of overlap. Um, so in fact, a lot of the research that we, from others that we use as the basis for ours, comes from, you know, sustainability journals, people working on climate change, uh, mitigation, uh, prevention, etc. Um, we've talked a lot about the seaweed, like seaweed is good for uh, climate prevention, it can be used for carbon sequestration, it can be used for food security in the world today, uh, but that's not the only one. There's also, like you were saying, also the single cell protein 
it can be used to uh, supplant our unsustainable substitute the unsustainable fishing um, to produce fish feed for the big fishes um, so that you know reduce overfishing um, it can be done for example the one the the, the methane based single cell protein you can use biogas as the feedstock which you can obtain by digesting biomass like um, uh, talking about say a waste biomass uh, instead of like burning or landfilling it or whatever, some of that you can turn into gas that then you use to feed this uh, bacteria, and then this bacteria then feed the um, uh, fish or feed ourselves. Um, this has clearly, clearly, oh, sorry, wasp. <laughs> um, it clearly has um, an application on what they call the circular economy, right? The transition towards the circular economy. That's the whole reason why people are, are doing these things. This, Hydrogen-based, methane-based signals, or protein production technologies, um, and then crop relocation. Even crop relocation has a um, an application here. Uh, we were just in our uh, all for the internal journal club the other day um, discussing this paper that just came out on I think Nature Food that was talking about how crop relocation could be deployed to maintain global agricultural yields uh, as the con as the um, impact of uh, climate change worsen, uh, you know, by changing uh, crop varieties, moving seeds around the world, it wouldn't need to be as dramatic or fast as would as the other about Russia scenarios. But the idea is the same, and it would really help maintain our our current agricultural yields. And those are the ones that come to mind right now. Uh, to, uh, to answer the other part of the question, actually, um, these these um, industrial or high tech food production systems I'm talking about. Because they're self-contained, they are, you know, enclosed in, in say, steel vessels like the bioreactors. Um, they are uh, resilient to climate changes. They are resilient to, to environmental changes, temperature changes, um, weather events. So what that means is because, you know, you know we can expect uh, climate conditions, environmental conditions, severe weather events to get much worse over time due to climate change. Having some of these technologies for food production allow us to have allows us to have a basis of um, a caloric basis that is not affected by by these um, by these restrictions. Unlike traditional crops, you know, a drought would not really affect uh, a nat natural gas or or biogas single cell protein production factory mm -hmm. because it doesn't use much water. Uh, it doesn't care much about the temperature outside. Or the wall, or the relative humidity outside. So just to give you an idea, yeah. Yeah, and like seaweed, for example, it it's also really resilient. I, j I just remember that seaweed can be used to feed livestock as well. And and actually, apparently, cows produce less methane uh, when they eat seaweed, which is good for exactly. the environment. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, people have been seeing ridiculous reductions in in methane emissions from from seaweed. I, I don't even. I, I was amazed when I first read that. There's already. A bunch of um, uh, startups working on this, uh, funded by by large food and large li large livestock companies, because they are really interested, obviously, in the in this technology. Ali, do you have anything else you wanna you wanna ask? Oh my gosh, honestly, so many things. But <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, respect the flow of the interview and our time constraints. So I am definitely excited to maybe have another conversation where we go into a few of these technologies in more in depth, but. Um, for now, I mean, I'm just fascinated and and so happy we've been able to talk about this. Yeah, it's been great. Juan, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you're you're brilliant. You have a lot going on. We're we're gonna keep our audience updated on what you're doing. Um, one last question is, if you had the opportunity to sit down at a table with and collaborate or debate with an organization or individuals. Who, who would they be? Do any names come to mind? And who do you think we should also be talking to? Oof. Uh, great question. And, and um, this could be something that you could email us after the fact, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you're not prepared to answer now. Yeah, I, I'll think about it. It's, it's hard enough, yeah. All right. Yeah, because a collaboration, breaking down... In, you know, breaking down uh, uh, institutional silos and bringing scientists, engineers entrepreneurs together to to brainstorm on these ideas is, is one of the biggest parts of, yeah. of i would love to talk to 
to people working in governments doing national risk assessments uh, to talk about some potential blind spots that they have over there, which is the reason why they are not preparing, at least not publicly, for for things like the ones I'm talking about. Ooh, that would be that would, but that would be very hard. That'd be a spicy interview. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I think I think when we list, you know, who we're trying to get together in this platform, it's to talk um, with one another. Politicians and policymakers has not has come up a lot in what is required for the deployment of a lot of the ideas that we've discussed, but we actually haven't really explored getting them to the table. So I think that's something that we're going to work on in the future because it is clearly a fundamental requirement moving forward. I mean, so many of these interviews that we've done, um, the, the solutions that are being proposed absolutely require both intranational and international cooperation, communication, and um, and commitment to to these kind of forward looking plans, and also the identification the identification of blind spots. That's a really good way to put it, and there are many. And I think that's exactly where communicating across expertise can be so helpful in so many situations. Yeah, yeah. You solve this problem by being interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary yeah. for sure. Thank you, Juan. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Go enjoy what is arguably a spectacular day over there in southern Spain. A um, <laughs> bit jealous over here in Connecticut. So <laughs> we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much.